But anyway, it, no, it, it went good. Went good last night. Praise the Lord for uh, his, his holy word. Uh, just, it's enough, as the old black preacher said, right? And uh, Woody, one of my favorite quotes, MacArthur said, the greatest enemy of the word of God is anything outside of the word of God. And the more you think about that statement, the more, more uh, profane, profound it becomes. And so we tonight are uh, here for one reason, and that's to study the Word of God, worship Him in this study. Brother Woody Moore is the speaker tonight, and Shannon is going to stand and lead us to the Lord in prayer. Good to be back with you tonight. Been thinking about this all day and looking forward to it. And uh, so thankful again to be here. I was listening to uh, one of my favorite preachers is Paul Washer. You may not, not have heard of him, but he's a great, great preacher. And he was telling a story, one of my favorite stories, and I hope I can get it right. But he was telling of a, of a great king. Uh, that had was going on a great on a journey on a far away uh, a far journey and um, he had had he had his queen there with him and he had he had her just the way he wanted her she was perfect the way she was uh, he had left his uh, right hand man in charge of the kingdom while he was gone and uh, he said that he had left a book, a list of things to do and things not to do and the way that he wanted his wife treated while he was gone and, and do not add to anything in that book and do not take anything away from that book. But you do exactly, you treat my wife exactly the way that that book says to treat her. And so he went on his journey and he said that, uh, that the wife, you know, she wore kind of a, just plain clothes, didn't wear makeup, wasn't too flashy, but she was just perfect and beautiful the way that she was. Didn't have to, didn't have to do all of those things uh, to be beautiful. She was perfect the way that she was. And his journey took him a little longer than he expected it to. And what, the, what, his, uh, what the, the, the man that was in charge of the kingdom while he was gone started noticing was that people, uh, people started uh, kind of veering away from uh, not noticing how beautiful the bride was because she was kind of plain and she, was, she needed to be spiced up a little bit. So he thought, well, you know, to, we're, losing the, we're losing the attention of the crowd, of the masses, and so what we need to do is just... Uh, we need to spice the bride up a little bit so that they will respect the kingdom again because she was the representative of the kingdom while the king was gone. And so he said that they put a little makeup on her and made her look prettier. They, they took the long, elegant dress that she had on and they put one on a little shorter just above her knees and made her look really, really fancy. And, and so they paraded her up and down the street and they noticed that the carn carnal men started coming back started coming back to the kingdom and noticing because the bride looked a little better than they, than they thought that she did before. And so what, what happened was when the king came home, he became so angry because he had left this man in charge of his bride and he thought that he needed to make the bride look a little better than what she did by spicing it up. And this is exactly what's happened uh, to the church today. The king has left us with an instruction book. And we are to not vary from the instruction book. The, it doesn't need to be spiced up. It is what it is, and it's enough, as Brother Gary said. Me and this lady was talking a while ago, and she said, I was raised in a conservative, Bible-believing church, and I thought, isn't it a shame that we have to use the terminology Bible-believing church as if there's any other thing? Really? I mean, if you're a church, you must be a Bible-believing church, or you're really not a church, right? Right? And so, and so what to, has happened today is, is that the church has, has, has 
bought into the idea that we need to spice this thing up a little bit. We need to become more, we need to become maybe a little more worldly so that we can appeal to worldly, ungodly people and they'll be more attracted to the church when that was never God's plan to begin with. Never God's plan to begin with and it never will be. And so what God wants out of the church is to be his bride, the bride that he bought and paid for through the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That what, that's what God wants the church to be. Amen? Amen. Turn with me, uh, if you will, uh, if you want to, in your Bibles. I want to begin uh, tonight in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, we hit on this just a little bit last night. And then we're going to get right into uh, this word of faith doctrine. I didn't mention last night um, the New Apostolic Reformation, which goes right along with uh, the word of faith, they hold to a lot of the same doctrine. I, I say it like this, the, the word of faith preachers are the, are the white suits and black ties, the Benny Hens of the world. The new apostolic reformation are a little more hip, skinny jeans and polo shirts, maybe muscle shirts and a few tattoos. And, but they're no different. You know, they just, uh, they really, they teach the same, they, they teach the same heresies and and I want to share this with you just for a second, and then we'll get right into some of the videos and, and uh, what we talked about last night leading up to the little God's doctrine. Uh, verse 6, chapter 1, Galatians. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. To pervert something, when I say... When I say pervert, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? If, I, if I was, we was walking down the street and I looked across the street and said, I know that guy, he's a pervert, what would be, what would be the first thing that pops in your mind would be that he, is, he, is, he is, has a lewd or a ungodly idea of sexual uh, relations or of sex in general, right? That's what you think of. Now, is, what he's done, he has perverted something that, God intended to be beautiful for a man and a woman in a monogamous till death, till God by death shall separate us relationship, right? For procreation and for enjoyment in, in the marriage bond. Is that not right? Is that not what the sexual... And, you, and he has perverted that into something that is totally uh, uh, unlike anything God had planned for it to be. Is that not right? And so what's Paul saying here? They've perverted, they've changed the God, they've perverted it into something that God had never intended for it to be. They perverted the gospel. And what these Judaizers was, were doing, and, and you don't have to look very far in the book of Galatians and even back up there in the book of Acts, they were saying, yeah, we, we understand that we're saved by grace through faith and, we, and that it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But look, I'm telling you, those boys can't be saved until they're circumcised. Is that not what was going on? So they added to it, didn't they? And other things, keeping of, of the holy days and the, abstaining from eating certain foods and all of that, but they had perverted the gospel. But though, look what Paul says. This is how serious it is. But though we, I don't care, he says, I don't care if it's me or anybody with me or an angel from heaven even, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed as we said before, so I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And that is the Greek is for uh, word for that is anathema. It's excommunication is what it is. And then he goes on in verse ten. He says, Do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And so the gospel tonight is being perverted. And it's being perverted all over the, the United States and really all around the world. Uh, the, the gospel that is uh, uh, in preached in a lot of churches today is nothing like, nothing like the gospel that the apostles taught and preached in the early church and the gospel that we're called to preach today. There's only one gospel. Paul told Timothy to preach the word. The only thing that has ever been uh, that the preacher has ever been commissioned to preach not opinion not self help not se self is the problem Amen. you understand that I get up every morning and look in the mirror and I see the biggest problem in my life it's myself 
It really is. Self-help don't work. You need something outside of yourself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so the, we're called to preach the gospel, to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine for the time will come, and we're in that time, that men will not endure sound doctrine, but shall after them their own lust heap up to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And that's where we're at today. People just want their ear, ears tickled. They just want a good, uh, they want to leave church feeling good about themselves, not feeling any conviction. And I promise you, you'll never be saved until you realize you're lost. I'm, it, it, listen. Go down the street tomorrow, wherever you go. Go into the Walmart, college campus, wherever you go. Ask a hundred people, do you believe in God? They, 90%, I, I would assume, 90 or so percent would probably say, yes, I believe in God. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Yeah, I believe in heaven and hell. Do you, where do you think you're going to go? Well, I'm going to go to heaven. Why would you go to heaven? You know what the the most uh, uh, um, the, the most frequent answer that you will get is because I'm a good person. And the fact of the matter is you're not that good of a person. And I'm not that good of a person. In me, that is in my flesh, Paul said, is no good thing. Apart from the, apart from the, the, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in my life, I am poor, blind, wretched, naked, miserable, just like the church at Laodicea. That's what's in me. I, I'll prove it to you. How many of you here tonight would be comfortable with me instead of showing these videos that I plan to show tonight, show a, a, a video of every thought that you had over the past seven days? Not over your life, just over the past seven days. Anybody here comfortable with that? I'm not comfortable with that. You know why? Because that, that makes us take a look on the inside of us. And on the inside of us, really, we're not that good. That's why we need a Savior. And until people understand that they're lost and in desperate, desperate need of a Savior, they're never going to reach out. You remember Jesus and the rich young ruler. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, the first thing he said, why you call me good? There's no one good but God. He said, you know what the law says? Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not, I forgot what he said. About four of them he named there. And then you know what the next thing out of that boy's mouth was? I'm, I'm, I'm good. He, he just got through saying there's nobody good but God. And now this guy says, I'm good. What was he saying? I'm God. What is that? The first thing that we talked about last night was Isaiah chapter 14, Satan saying, I will be like God. And what that young man didn't realize was what he was so far away from God. Here's what we would have done. Brother Gary, what do I need to do to go to heaven? And I, I've done this before. I've, I was guilty of this. What do, you need, what do I do to go to heaven? Well, what, do, you, do you believe that you're a sinner? Yeah, I believe I'm a sinner. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sin? Yeah, I, I believe Jesus died for my sin. Then, then pray this prayer after me and, and you'll be locked in. You know, that's, the, that's modern day evangelism. I'm not saying Brother Gary does this. I wasn't even... But, but, but look, that's modern day evangelism. And we just tally it up. We... we uh, we mark another check, check. He just checked that box off in his life. I've done that. I, I, say, I say to people, have you been saved? I've been saved two or three times. Good chance you've never been saved to begin with. You know, because they don't have a clear understanding of what salvation truly is. They've never seen themselves as a depraved individual that is totally incapable of saving himself. That's why, in my opinion... Churches all over America are setting full of people that think they're saved that are not saved. And again, it's not my, it's not my duty or my desire or my d job to judge whether people are saved or not. I'm not saying that. But I promise you this, there are people sitting in churches all over America today that think that they're saved that are not saved. They've been led into a false sense of security by some hotshot preacher that said if you pray this prayer after me or if you raise your hand in an invitation and just say a few words or if you sign the back of uh, your little New Testament then you but nothing ever changes nothing's ever changed the Bible says if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things have passed away behold all things have become new 
Margaret said, don't get up there and preach tonight. You need to get right to your stuff because you're going to take too long. She, she didn't say it that way, but that's what she told me. She said, don't need to go back over all that stuff. Just go right on through your material. Or your... Let's go to John chapter, John chapter 10. We're going to talk about the little God's doctrine. I told you that as we move through uh, these heretical teachings of the Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movement, that you'll see that they get worse as we go. And you say, well, how could it get worse than, how could it get worse than what we talked about last night? You're, you're about to see. You're about to see. I want to play with uh, for you real quickly, and then we're going to look at this scripture in John chapter 10. I want to play for you real quickly. Uh, clip three, is that Creflo Dollar? Watch this real quick. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man and everything produces after its own kind, if horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the God head gets together and say let us make man then what are they producing they're producing gods now I gotta hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this but I'm gonna say to you right now you are gods little g you are gods because you came from God and you are gods you're not just human the only human part about you is this physical body that you live in Okay, now he's talking about in Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 1, there I think verse 26, he says, God says, let us make man in our image. You are made in the image of God. The image of God, God is triune. You are triune, your body, soul, and spirit. That is the extent of you being made in the image of God. You are not God. You are not equal to God. You're not co-equal to God. God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Coexisting, co-equal. That's about as far as I can go in explaining the Trinity to you. But I understand this. The Trinity is a biblical concept. And even though I can't get my pea brain wrapped around it, that doesn't mean it's not true. Okay? And now, now we can try all these different ways uh, to try to explain the Trinity, and, and I would uh, do a horrible job at doing that. But we are not... God. We are not God. Now, where does that come from? How in the world could, could, a, could a preacher come up with a concept such as this? Now, John chapter 10, uh, verse 30. Let's look at verse, start in verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And when he said this, steam began to roll out of the Jews' ears. Then the Jews took up stones to st again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shewed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, that thou, being a man, maketh thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, Ye are God's? If, ye call, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath, sent, sanct, hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. So this is where it comes from. 
Now, you have to remember what we said last night. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. And what's the last part of that? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly divide. Now, you could say, well, I could see where somebody would read that. And, and like, well, it says it there. Yeah, it says, ye are gods. Turn with me now to, to Psalm, the Psalm, the Psalm chapter 82. Psalm chapter 82. Jesus is quoting out of Psalm chapter 82. Psalm chapter 82. And if you have subheadings in your Bible, it should say something like God and the judges. Um, if it doesn't, it says something like that in the subheading. Some, some of you have, have that. Okay. Now, so look what he says here. Let's read the whole psalm and get the context of what Jesus was saying. And you never want to take the Bible out of its context. You always want to study it and to understand what he's saying when he says something or when the, the, the Word of God. You can make the Bible just about say anything you want it to say if you isolate Scripture and set it apart and say this is what the Bible... Well, the Bible says this. Look at here what it says. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly? Who's he talking to? He's talking to somebody. How long are you going to judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. You think he's talking to gods, plural? He's talk, but he's talking to someone here. And I'll, I'll submit to you right now that he's talking to the judges. If you remember back before there was kings, uh, the last, my goodness, there's a mess. The last verse in the book of Judges says, In that day there was no king in the land, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Is that not where the church is today? It's just a free-for-all. Everybody just does whatever they want to do. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of, thy, out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye, like all men, ye shall die like all men. Do gods die? Does God... No, he's from everlasting to everlasting, right? But ye shall die like all men and shall fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. He's speaking of the judges, and because, because they ruled over the people, the people saw them as gods. That's who he's talking about here. And Jesus says... You, you, you believe that? You believe what the psalmist says? That, that God called them gods? And, and the, word, the Greek word is, or the Hebrew word is Elohim. But I'll tell you this also, and I was studying this this afternoon. There's, there's three places at least in the book of Exodus that the word, for, the word translated judges, talking about the judges, is translated Elohim also. So, so you can't just say, that he's got to be talking about the Godhead. He's talking about the judges, and you have to go back to Psalm chapter 82, which Jesus was clearly quoting from, and understand what he was saying when he quoted that scripture. He's not saying that you are gods. He's not saying that you are gods. Now, we have some more. Any questions on that? Anything you want to add to that, Brother Gary? Please do. Sometimes it happens that you and I talk to each other and discuss and get some input. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and listen, it, it, it is to, to a, a person that's not necessarily very deep in the Word, a, a, a Bible a student, a student of the Word, you could see how someone would fall into this. I mean, most parishioners trust their pastor or they wouldn't go to that church to begin with. Right, but but again, remember where we started. There were false prophets in the land. Even as there shall be false prophets among you, who shall privately bring in damnable heresies. And these heresies heresies are destructive heresies, and this is one of the foremost destructive heresies uh, of the Word of Faith movement, the New Apostolic Reformation uh, movement. Benny Hinn says that he's a little Messiah. 
He takes it a step further than saying he's a little God. He's a little Messiah. What is a Messiah? What, who was the Messiah? The, the promised one of Israel, wasn't he? The Savior of all of those who will call upon the name of the Lord. And Benny Hinn is equal, is equal to him in his eyes. These men are arrogant and one day, uh, as Second Peter says, will be judged. Uh, I want to show you someone else who taught the word of faith doctrine. It may, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, the, the little God's doctrine, uh, and it may surprise you. Clip four, if you would. I don't know how far we'll go through this. I may stop. Jesus was. Jesus said that every human being was a God. That is written that ye are gods. I'm, I'm a God, God and you're a God. And I'm a God and I'm going to stay a God until you recognize that you're a God. And when you recognize you're a God, I shall go back into principle and will not appear as a personality. You are God. But until I see all of you knowing who you are, I'm going to be very much what I am. God Almighty God. Never, never. You never can do that in a covenant relationship. Do you know what else that has settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, yeah. that we are gods. I am a little god. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have his Reason. name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. Yes. I am a little god. Critics, you are hey, god. anything that he is. Yes. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. And Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus, when he came into the earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't a lot like God. He's God manifested in the flesh. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Tell me what you hear that, that, the Spirit that's of God saying. Y'all had enough of that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it's. you understand what we're talking about here? You, and, and you say, well, that's that's a few years back. And it was a few years back. Um, I, I, I want you to, how many of you have heard of Elevation Church? Very, very popular church. Uh, wonderful. They, they, they write some wonderful songs, sing some wonderful music. Um, Stephen Furtick is the pastor of Elevation Church. It's probably one of the fastest growing churches, especially in the southeast. I think it's in I think it's in North Carolina. I may be wrong about that. I think it's in Charlotte, North Carolina. But if I'm wrong, uh, don't hold that against me. But Stephen Furtick is the pastor of that, and he's he is uh, he is a, a disciple of T.D. Jakes. And maybe some of you have heard of, of T.D. Jakes. We may get to him uh, a little later. But if you would play clip 17, and and what I want to do here with clip 17 is, is to I want you to get the context of what he's teaching or preaching in this message. I don't want to just throw, throw what he says out there and you say, well, you just picked a clip out when he made a, a, a blunder uh, and said something stupid. We've all said so, something stupid. I've, you know, so, but I want you to see the context uh, before. So clip seven. And we trust that God's presence will be powerful wherever you are. And I really mean that. And that's kind of what my sermon's about today as well. So listen to this in Genesis chapter 34, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me obnoxious to the Canaanites and Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. Now go to Genesis 35, verse 11. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The NIV 84 says, kings will come from your body. So I want to preach for a moment, and God told me to tell you this. 
it's always been in you. First red flag was, somebody tell me. God told me to tell you this. God told me to tell you this. Now, so you got the context. Jake, he's talking about Jacob there in, in chapter 35 of Genesis. Jacob, uh, to, God commanded him to go back to Bethel. Uh, and he had and he had messed around in chapter thirty four, made a mess of things, and went uh, ended up in Shechem. Oh, ended up in Succoth, and uh, Shechem uh, raped his daughter. If you remember that, and two of his boys went and and uh, well, actually, all of his boys ended up going back over there. They circumcised them guys that were in that were in Succoth, and then they went back in and murdered them all. It was just a big old bloodbath mess. And uh, Jacob says, because you've done this, they're gonna, everybody's going to hate us in this land. And they, so they go back to Bethel. And you know what happens when he goes back to Bethel. It's back to the place where he got saved, really, back in chapter 25, maybe, uh, of Genesis. But I want you to see the rest of this. If you would play, what is that next clip? I, I'm sorry. It's uh, 18. It's 18, yeah. Same message now. Houston, we have a problem. It's not to let people put anything on you. And I'm not just talking about failure. I'm talking about success. Jacob's biggest issue is that he always identified himself by something external. So when it came time to make peace with Esau, he sent gifts ahead of him. Because he thought, maybe my gift will bring me peace. And some of us are like that. We always think we have to make a good impression. We're always living in an avatar. We're always living in some version of ourselves that seems presentable. Or we're always identified. I talked to you about this last week, about what we can do. And so in doing what we can do, other people will identify you by what you can do. And then they will limit you by what you can do. And then you will begin to think that you are what you do. And then you will lose yourself and gain the world. And Jesus said, what good is it? Don't let anybody put anything on you that will cause you to forget what God put in you. That goes for your struggles. See, I think Jacob, I think Jacob, his name, his name means supplanter, but his new name, Israel, is almost just as bad. It means struggles with God. So he's trying to get him to see, you've never been fighting with Laban. You've never been fighting with Esau. The fight that you have to win for your life has not been with them. It's always been in you. Because if you believe it's in you, there's nothing anybody can put on you that can cancel what I put in you. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. It's always been in you. It's always been in you. That teaching gift has always been in you. You just had to get past what you would put on yourself. The idea that I'm not a preacher, I'm just a little girl. I don't have anything to say. That was always in you. It was in you when you were sitting at Life Action Revival, listening to Steve Canfield six nights a week, and God was filling you with his word. It just took the right rain to bring the seed out of the soil for what God put in you. When you were just a little girl. It's always been in you. And there's nobody that can leave my life that can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It is God that worketh in you. It's always. 
I wish you, I wish, uh, you could have seen it. He's up there pounding his chest. I am God Almighty. Um, this, is where, this is where this comes from. I have a quote from him. I thought I had a, I thought I had a clip, and I looked through my stuff earlier uh, in the week, and I didn't have it. But another, another instance when he uses this uh, ideology or this theology, uh, speaking to Moses, when God said to Moses, I am sent you, you tell him I am sent you, what he was saying is that you are as I am. He was saying that you are a God. Do you understand how heretical this is and how serious, how serious of a problem uh, that it is? Um, and we could just go on and on. I, I think I put a new clip, and maybe Brother Gary has already shown uh, this to you. Jesse DePlantis, I don't know if you, he, I call him the Raging Cajun. Um, but he, uh, he is, um, uh, clip 25, Jesse DePlantis is, and I want to set this up real quick. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, the scripture says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And we shall call his name Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he's preaching this scripture, and he, he interjects himself into the Prince of Peace, the, the Everlasting Father. And I want you to see this, and I want you to see how subtle this is, or, or really for you guys it probably won't be so subtle, but for the crowds that he's teaching and preaching to, it must have just flown right over their head because they think it's the greatest thing ever. So... In the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, I want to read verse 6. For unto us, Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yet the book of Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. So, when I look at Isaiah 9, 6, where is the government now? It's on us. The government of the world is on mankind. And because we're made in God's image and in God's likeness, you can call us wonderful. Yes. Counselor. Hey. Mighty God, Christ in us. The everlasting father. Woo! The prince of peace. That's what it means to be the gift that Jesus gave to you. So when you are a gift of God, it gives you the ability to act like God. He, he thinks he's a gift of God. How many of you think Brother Gary will wear one of them bows next, next Christmas? <laughs> I wish I hadn't even said that. You're looking at me like I... <laughs> oh man! Do you understand? I mean, look, this is—it's it's just beyond—it's beyond ludicrous. It really is. Um, but it's—it's it's terrible. It's terrible. It's—it is. It has to be a stench in the nostrils of God, doesn't it? it has nothing to do. That has nothing. Uh, uh, convenient to go to Ephesians chapter one verse five. It has nothing to do with what he's even talking about. But it fit his narrative, didn't it? And that's what they'll do there. Uh, Stephen Furtick, the, just a little bit before. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I ordained you to be a prophet of the nation. Had nothing to do with what he was even talking about. Just whatever comes, whatever fits the narrative, whatever fits the message that he's preaching at the time. Not rightly dividing the word of truth. It's, uh, it's ungodly, it's heretical, and it must be called out. So I want you to understand this little God's doctrine. Any questions or thoughts on, on the little God's doctrine? Brother Gary will be glad to answer your questions. Go ahead. Yeah, and, 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 and another thing is, is Adam fell into sin. Could, could God have fallen into sin? No. Um, it, 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 when you ask any kind, any kind of spiritual-minded questions at all, you, you come back to this idea that this is totally heretical. It's, 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 it's complete heresy. But I'm telling you guys, 
This is taught to the masses all over the world, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Uh, Paul Washer, again, I, I'm quoting him again, but he's a great missionary around the world, Peru and, and other places. But he says it's, it's infiltrated churches there. I mean, they're, they're, they're not just sitting down there in Charlotte, North Carolina or, or Dallas, Texas. They're, they're, think they're evangelizing their version of the gospel all around the world too. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it... Exactly. And you care less about your soul, and you care less about your sick, and you care less. And, and even though they preach this health uh, uh, doctrine, they could care less about your soul. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Remember where we started again last night. And with feigned words, they shall make merchandise of you. And all over the world, they're just, they're just raking it in. They're raking it in, raking it in uh, 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 from vulnerable people. That look, you you know, I I mentioned Justin Peters last night. He he was born with cerebral palsy, and um, he got he got he was told by a friend that hey, there's a there is a uh, a faith healer coming into town, and I need to I, I need you to, I want you to go see him. He'll heal you. And so he went, and uh, he never made it up to the stage. Um, now. Call me cynical again, probably because he was one of the ones that was truly uh, in need of healing there. Todd White. Y'all know Todd White? You ever heard of Todd White? He's an African-American man, got dreadlocks, wears shorts, preaching, uh, preaching, and um, he's, he's a, he claims to be a faith healer. And he'll walk up and down the streets of, of big cities, Los Angeles, California, and he'll stop somebody along the way, and he'll say, he'll say, uh, are you, are you, are you, are you, Feeling okay today? Is there anything wrong with you? And nah, I'm, feel, I'm feeling pretty good. And and they say, Are you sure you not got any ailments at all? Well, well, my back's hurting a little bit. My back's been, well. Won't you? Why don't you lay down? And just and 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 it's really uh, conniving and and almost uh, almost very clever the way he does it. Uh, and he'll have the guy say, "Well, lay down here on this, lay down here on this bench." Well, I see the problem. The problem is you got one leg longer than the other. I don't know how many people in Los Angeles, California, he has lengthened the legs of, you know. And it's the oldest trick in the book. It's just, it's just a magic trick. Is all it is. And he claims that he's lengthening these legs. You know what? If if Todd White had the gift of healing, you know what he would do? He'd go over there to the VA where uh, some GI had lost his leg from his knee down. And he'd put that leg back on him if he had the gift of healing. Wouldn't he? He'd go to, uh, he'd go to Norton's Children's Hospital where they're laying up there. Them little babies are laying up there dying of cancer, things like that. He'd heal them. Wouldn't, well, you, Brother Woody, you don't believe in, in healing? I told you last night I believe in healing. According to God's Word, God is, is, is in control of all that. God has a divine plan. In His providence, He chooses to heal some. And in His providence, He chooses not to heal some. Do you not believe in the gift of healing? I don't know that I, we even need to go there tonight. I know you have the you know you have the cessationist and you have the continuationist, and the cessationist says that the that the the miraculous gifts, the sign gifts, ceased at the ap- end of the apostolic age. Now I'm just going to tell you. And then there's then there's the continuationist that they're still in order today. I'm I'm about right in here somewhere. Probably not all the way over here because I can't point you to a scripture that says the sign gifts ended at this time. Scripture doesn't say that, okay? So I'm not going to say that. The gift of tongues still in order today? I, that, I don't understand it all. I don't know that. I don't, uh, but, but every, every um, time that I've seen it exercised, it was out of order and not according to the Word of God. Now, I'm just going to leave it there. The gift of healing, if, if these guys that say they have the gift of healings truly had the gift of healings, they wouldn't be profiting off of it, living in $10 million mansions. They would be healing people that are sick. That's my opinion. I'm sorry? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. Because they're not God. They were not God. Yeah, about after about the second lash, they would have said, that, with this has gone far enough. I'm, I'm a fraud, and I'll be glad to tell you I'm a fraud. I didn't aim to go there. I hope I hadn't messed anything up here tonight, but we're good. <laughs> All right, any more thoughts on... On the little God's doctrine. Okay, here's what they teach on the fall. The fall. Adam, we talked about this just a second ago. Um, Adam was, they teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. Kenneth Hagin said Adam could stand toe to toe with God without any feeling of inferiority. Then why, may I ask you, did he sow fig leaves together, together and hide himself, cover his nakedness? If he could stand toe to toe with God without excuse me, any feeling of any inferiority. He was a, uh, Kenneth Hagin taught that he was a carbon copy of God. And we just said this, Adam sinned. Could God have sinned? The answer to that is no. Here's what they teach. When Adam sinned, his godhood was transferred to Satan and God therefore lost his legal right to earth and was banished from it. Kenneth Copeland, this is a quote from Kenneth Copeland. It's another one of them twits. But when Adam turned and gave that dominion to Satan, look where it left God. It left God on the outside looking in. God had no right to do anything about it. Could he manipulate and operate? No, because he'd be doing the very same thing that Satan did in the first place. If God injected himself illegally into the earth, what Satan, this, which is what Satan intended for him to do, was to fall for it and pull off an illegal act and turn the light off in God and subordinate God to himself. Does that even make any sense? This is a quote. Now you see, he says, now you see the complicated predicament that God is in. You can understand why some would say, wonder why God lets all this bad stuff happen and wars go on. He doesn't. There's nothing he can do about it. It's a quote from Kenneth Copeland. Satan is now the legal God of the planet. Now, 2 Corinthians, we talked about this, I think, last night a little bit. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter Four, I believe it is, it says, For the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. Right? When, I'm telling you, when the light of the glorious gospel shined unto you, the lights went on, and you was like, boy, that's what I want. I need that Savior. I need a Savior. Right? Isn't that what happened to you? The, light, the lights went on. Let's the light, but, but now, the God of this world, you say, well, why wouldn't everybody? Why wouldn't everybody come to Jesus? Because the God of this world has blinded their minds, has blinded their minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. Now the world there, world in that passage of scripture is the Greek word is aeon and it means age. The God of this age. Okay? Not necessarily God is the the creator of heaven and the earth. Our God Yahweh. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the God. He is the He is the ruler of this planet. Now, Satan has dominion here. Sa- Satan does. He, he is a formidable foe. And all you have to do is think about the last time you've done something stupid and you could say he is a formidable foe because he was behind it, right? And he's behind all of, all of this junk. But this, this word uh, world here is aeon. He's the God of this age. Uh, when a person gets saved, he regains his godhood. This is why the prosperity preachers hold fast to health and wealth because, as Brother Gary says, who who doesn't want to be healthy and who doesn't want to be wealthy? God can't be poor and God can't be sick. So you're a God, right? Do you you understand the, the, the philosophy? Now, I know you don't believe it, but do you understand the philosophy behind where they get it at or why they say what they say? If you have... um. If you have clip five, would you play it? Who is this the big, who's the biggest failure in the Bible? God is. What you say? <laughs> you know, everybody asks you, say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. 
Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Hmm. Oh, what, what, what? Don't you turn that set off. <laughs> you listen to what? You, I told you now, you sit still a minute. You know me well enough. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell something that I can't prove the Bible. He lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. I mean, you figure all that, that's a lot of real estate, brother. Gone down the drain. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he never said he's a failure. <laughs> and you're not a failure till you say you're one. I, I feel the same way. I, some of this I feel uncomfortable even showing. I really do. You're not a failure. The reason why God's not going to say he's a failure is because he's never failed at anything. Yeah. And, and, and look, he didn't lose Adam. Adam willfully chose to sin against God. He didn't lose Eve. Eve willfully chose to sin against God. But he did this. He redeemed them. You know what he did? Genesis, that, right there at the end of Genesis chapter 3, one of the most important verses in the Bible. Two of the most important verses in the Bible are in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity, verse 15, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. That's a different story for another day. I know Brother Gary's taught you on that. But right there at the end of Genesis chapter 3, one little verse said, And God made coats of skin to cover their nakedness. Do you understand what happened there? Something had to die. Something that had absolutely nothing to do with their sin. It's the beautiful picture of Christ. It's really the first picture of Christ we get in the Word. It's the innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust. That lamb, and I like to think it was a lamb. I don't know that it was a lamb. But I'm tell, can you imagine Adam and Eve? Can you imagine the horror that they, must have, that they must have been experiencing when God pulls that whatever it was up there, let's say it was a lamb, and slaughters that thing right in front of them? They'd never seen anything like it. Blood flowing. And he skinned that thing and covered them with, covered their nakedness, covered their sin with that coat of skin. The innocent for the guilty. And it's exactly what he did for you and I. The just for the unjust. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. That's what they believe about the fall. Basically, God reproduced himself in Adam. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, I am. This is a, another quote from, from Kenneth Cop Copeland. And I wish I had it on tape. I couldn't find the video and I, I had it on audio, but I didn't put the audio on here. But it says, Jesus says, I am. Uh, and he said, when Jesus said, I am, I just smile and say, I am too. This is blasphemy. It really is. It's, it's, it's blasphemy. Again, and we've said it, the, the, they appeal to two of man's greatest desires, health and wealth. They call it the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel. And we, we declared to you last night that the gospel doesn't need any adjectives. It's good enough like it is. It's good enough like it is. Now I want to move into, what time is it? Early? Okay, good. I want to move into uh, a section called the softening of sin. And Brother Gary hit on this just a minute ago. We're going we're gonna to teach on the softening of sin. And you'll see that in these churches quite often. Joseph Prince says, The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which means to change your mind. And, and he's right about that. If you look the Greek word up there in the book of Acts when Peter says repent and believe the gospel or however he says it there, it's metanoia. This is a correct statement, but he goes on to say, when Joel and I preach, and I'll let you guess who Joel is. When Joel and I preach, we may not use the word repentance, but people are repenting. They go from thinking negatively to thinking positively. So is that what repentance is? It's not what repentance is. Now you say, well, well he got the word right. The word is a changing of, of the mind. What was Peter saying to those Jews? Repent and believe the gospel. They had to change their, they had to change their mind in a big way. 
because they didn't, they wasn't trusting that Jesus Christ, they had to change their mindset that this law can never save me. That the only way I can be saved is putting my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he meant behind a change. They had to change their mind. Because what did he say? This, this, the one that, that you crucified. The one, remember what he just kept, he kept hammering it down. The one whom you crucified. The one whom God raised from the dead. This same Jesus, repent and believe the gospel. And he was telling them, you're going to have to change your mind about who Jesus is. Repentance also includes a turning away from sin. It always includes a turning away from sin. It's doing a, a 180, you could say. Um, what's that guy's name? He was, uh, he was a preacher in New York. Carl Lentz. Carl Lentz is uh, one of the new uh, the hipsters. Uh, actually, he was uh, caught up in a, uh, an extramarital affair, and he's lost uh, his church. And, and, and look, I, I, know, I know there's been other men of God that have, have done that and, and God's forgiven them and, and that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that he's, a, he's a dying, dying and going to hell because he's, he, got a, he got caught up in a mess. God, if, if he's repented of that and God has forgiven him, then, then God is gracious, a gracious God and has forgiven him. But he was asked by Oprah Winfrey at the height of his ministry, which was about four years ago, he was asked, so you're, so you're saying that, Jesus, that, that for, a person to be, to, for a person to go to heaven, they had to be born again. They had to be born of the, of the Spirit. They had to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And he said, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. This is their mentality. This is their uh, mindset. And they soften the blow of sin. If you would put clip 19 in, T.D. Jakes, T.D. Jakes, I think you'll find this interesting. A question coming in from uh, Black185 in our, in our uh, digital community. Said, do you, do you think, I'm assuming, uh, the LGBT community and the black church can coexist? Absolutely. I, I, let me push that question, because that, that's sort of an obvious yes. Church ain't turning nobody away. How should the black church and the LGBT community exist? I think it's going to be diverse from church to church. Every church has a different opinion on the issue, and every gay person is different. And I think that to, to speak the church, the black church or white church or any kind of church you want to call it are all the same is totally, totally not true. And all gay people are not the same. The, the, the types of relationships that are afforded are based on the types of people in each individual case. Yeah. And LGBTs of types and sorts have to find a household of worship that reflects what your views are and what you believe like anybody else. And the church should have the right to have its own convictions and values. If you don't like those convictions and values and you totally disagree with it, don't try to change my house, move into your own and, and establish that sort of thing and find somebody who gets what you get about faith. And uh, trust me, I've talked to enough LGBT, they are not all the same. Oh, for sure. <laughs> on anyway, any, all Christians no, no. Uh, but how, how do we, first of all, has your thinking evolved on this? E evolved and evolving. Evolved and evolving. Where, where, are you, where are you? I think that where I am is to better understand. We bought the church bought into the myth that this was a Christian nation. And once you get past that, which a lot of people are going to criticize me because they're still going to think it's a Christian nation, which is a whole different show. Mm -hmm. But once you begin to understand that democracy and, and that a republic actually is designed to be an overarching system to protect our unique nuances, then we no longer look for public policy to reflect biblical ethics. If we can divide or what you would call separation of church and state, yeah. then we can dwell together more effectively. Because atheists, agnostics, uh, Jews, all types of people, Muslims pay into the government, the government then cannot reflect one particular view over another just because we are the dominant group of religious people in the country because those numbers are changing every day. We need a neutralized government that protects our right to disagree with one another and agree with one another. Mm -hmm. So that covers... Evolved and evolving. Um... It is convenient, I suppose, to find, hey, I told you last night, you want to live in a particular sin? There's, church, there's a church down the road that will, that will con condone your sin, not condemn it. I mean, probably have them right here in, in Millenburg County, I assume. I, I know we probably have them in, in Butler County that will, you know, you can, you can live in sin and come and live in sin without any, any, uh, any threat of that sin being called out. 
because the last thing we want to do is offend you. You don't understand that the gospel is the most offensive message that's ever been given. Think about it. I, I heard MacArthur one time say that he said this, a, a guy was questioning him, and he said, "Does it bother that bother you that you offend people?" He said, "Not at all. It's my job to offend people." And he, he and he said, "I don't want you to think that I'm being a smart aleck and saying that I go around trying to offend people." But he said, "The gospel message that we are commissioned to preach is an offensive message." Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How much more offensive could you get? Think about it. Go try that one at Western Kentucky University tomorrow. Get you a microphone and stand out there in the middle of them kids coming in and preach that message. They'll be throwing whatever they can find to throw at you because it's an offensive message. Convenient. It's convenient to find a church that will... I keep going back to it. In that day, there was no king in the land, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And I think you ought to just preach that Sunday. I think you ought to preach that Sunday. I'm telling you, he could, he could, he could wear that one out. He could wear y'all out with that one, I bet. We did. We did. But is that not where we're at today? You know, this, 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 church, this, this one will just accept that. And, you know, it's just a, look, again, if, if you're going to believe that we are, I believe, and, and you may not agree with me on this, but I believe that this nation is experiencing the Romans' one wrath of God. We are right in the middle of experiencing the Rome. God has, is withdrawing himself from this nation because we have, we've done exactly what you, you look at. If you looked at Romans 1, and, and again, just real quickly, I promise you I won't keep you there long, but you look at what, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, this wrath of God, and I know Brother Gary's taught you on this, it's not the, not the wrath of God. When you think of wrath, you think of just, just losing their mind and just going crazy and wearing someone out. This is the wrath of withdrawing himself or the wrath of abandonment. And look what he says here. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shewed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, but, but because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their own imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Fools. The Greek word for fools there is moreno. They became morons. That's the word we get from Moreno. Morons. And, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man. This is the epitome of idolatry. You know what the greatest sin in America is today? It's idolatry. Making a God in your own image. My God says that it's just fine if I want to live a homosexual lifestyle, if I want to live a drunken lifestyle, if I want to... Because, of course he does. Because you made him up. It's idolatry. Now look what happens here. This is the downward spiral of, of, of a nation or a people as, they, as God withdraws himself. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So here you have the, the, the you could say, the sexual revolution. That started back in the 60s, didn't it? Who changed the, the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. You don't, have to, you don't have to be real spiritual minded to figure out what he's talking about here. So now we have the homosexual revolution. And likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which is meat, which was meat. Now here, look, you're wearing into another one. 
And even as they did not to like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient. This mind of completely void of judgment. This is where trans- transgenderism and pedophilia and all of these things enter in. So we started with a sexual revolution, then we start, then we moved into a, a homosexual revolution, and now we're moving right into this this complete mind that is completely void of judgment. How many of you have said uh, in the last two years, I cannot believe what I'm seeing? How many of you ever dreamed in a... How many of you ever even dreamed that these teachers over here at Muhlenberg High School, Muhlenberg County High School, would have to deal with a young man or a young woman wanting to 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 use one of those little things that the cats use the bathroom in? Because they want to be a Furby or whatever you call them. I had, a, I had a lady that goes to our church, send me a video, and I wish I'd never seen it. But she was working out at, a, at a, uh, one of those places you work out at. And what do you call them? A gym maybe, right? Yeah, a gym. So she was working out at this fitness center, right? And, and there was this guy dressed like a cat on the treadmill next to her, licking his arms, and just, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. What, what, we just read about it in Romans chapter 1. Did we not? A mind that is completely void of judgment. And that's where we're at. You say, well, has God given up on America? I don't know. That's not for me to say. That's not for me to say. I can tell you who he hadn't given up on. He hadn't given up on his church. And that's why we need to be the bride of Christ until he comes again. If it's tonight, if it's tomorrow, if it's 200 years from now and we're already with him in glory and we just come back to our resurrected bodies, that'll be fine. But I'm telling you, wouldn't it be just pretty cool to be the generation that's raptured out of here? Huh? I think about that quite often. One more clip and I'll be done for tonight. Rob Bell wrote a book called Love Wins. Rob Bell is a part of the emergent church. Uh, that's turned into, they don't call it really the emergent church anymore. They call it uh, the progressive church, the more the, 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 far, the far-leaning liberal uh, churches. Rob Bell is one of the leaders of that. Rob Bell came to Morgantown, Kentucky a few years back and, t- and taught at a church there in Morgantown, and that's about all I'll say about that. But if you would... Several years ago we had an art show at our church and people brought in all kinds of sculptures and paintings and we put them on display and there was this one piece that had a quote from Gandhi in it. And lots of people found this piece compelling. They'd stop and sort of stare at it and take it in and reflect on it, but not everybody found it that compelling. Somewhere in the course of the art show, somebody attached a handwritten note to the piece and on the note they had written, reality check. He's in hell. Gandhi's in hell. He is. And someone knows this for sure and and felt the need to let the rest of us know. Will only a few select people make it to heaven? And will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And if that's the case, how do you become one of the few? Is it what you believe or what you say or what you do or who you know or something that happens in your heart? Or do you need to be initiated or baptized or take a class or converted or being born again? How does one become one of these few? And then there is the question behind the questions. The real question, what is God like? Because millions and millions millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God? How could that God ever be good? How could that God ever be trusted? And how could that ever be good news. This is why lots of people want nothing to do with the Christian faith. They see it as an endless list of absurdities and inconsistencies and they say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? See, what we believe about heaven and hell is incredibly important because it exposes what we believe about who God is and what God is like. Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's, that's good enough.
Y'all saw enough of that too, didn't you? You understand, you understand that, that Rob Bell is, is what you would call a universalist, that everyone will eventually uh, go to heaven, that ultimately love wins out, and the book that he's promoting there is Love Wins. Uh, and that's what the book is all about. Love ultimately wins out. Everyone will go to heaven because God is love. He asks what kind of, what kind of God would allow someone to go to hell? A holy God. A holy God. God. Is God's will for you to go to hell? Absolutely not. God's will for you is, to, is that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. But God gave you a free will. God gave you a free will. And you can choose to uh, receive the free gift of God of eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son, or you can choose to reject that and die and go to a devil's hell. That's your choice. That's your family's choice. That's my choice. Right? And, and look, we don't, we, don't get to, we don't get to make up the rules here. It's been set. It's been, the, either, either God's Word is, is true from cover to cover, or we're wasting our time here tonight. What you have to decide is, is all Scripture given by inspiration of God? Is all Scripture profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? Or is it not? And if it's not, then we're wasting our time. But you believe that. You believe that it is. And that's why you're here tonight. And I'm thankful that you're here. And I want you to understand that it's not... It's not I, I'm not condemning or... or I'm, not, I'm not condemning... Uh, people to hell, that's not my job. Is Gandhi in hell? If Gandhi didn't trust the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, the blood that he shed on Calvary, then Gandhi's in hell. That's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible. Did he deserve to go to hell? He, had, he deserved to go to hell just like you and I deserve to go to hell. Thank God through his grace and mercy we've trusted Christ as our Savior and we've, saved, we've been saved. God saved us. God saved us. He saved us because there's something to be saved from. He said, he said in there, what, what you believe about heaven and hell is real important. And, and he's exactly right there. That's the one thing that I believe that he got right. i tell you what he believes about hell. He's, he's also, uh, what, what would you call it, an annihilationist. Same as a, same as a, uh, a Jehovah's Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, they believe in annihilationism, which means that basically if you've, if you've never been saved and you die apart from Christ, that you just, dis, you just disintegrate. You just... You're just annihilated. Um, that's, I guess that's kind of convenient also if you want to live a life apart from God, you know. And, that, that, and, that, and that's everywhere. And I, again, I'm not, I'm not making, you, you understand I'm not just set up here making stuff up, right? I mean, it's what Je Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe that. Seventh-day Adventists believe a, a lot of what they believe is very similar to what you and I believe until it comes to the doctrine of hell. Uh, but they don't believe in eternal hell. They don't believe in eternal damnation. They, they are, what I just said, was annihilationists. And uh, they believe that as soon as you die, if you're lost, that you would just be, you would, how, how long would it be? It would be just however long it took you to burn up, which would be uh, immediate. Immediate. Brother Gary, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Why don't we give God a big hand clap of praise, okay? And here I'm sitting here thinking, i got to get up here and follow this guy Sunday morning, you know. Have you enjoyed it tonight? Yeah. Any questions? Any questions that Woody would a could answer for you? Anything? You got it all, didn't you? All right. I knew you would, Duvalls. I knew you would. Amen. Let's stand together. Brother Woody, go to the back door, please.